All right, and am I up and ready to go? I believe so. I, we don't see okay. your slides, but we we'll hear you. Yeah, I don't. Dr. Lassie, are you able to share your screen, the green button at the bottom? Oh, uh, okay, hold on. Yeah, there we go. Okay, and then I'll ask you for your slides, which other screen that would be on. Okay, yeah, I see it here, I believe. This looks like this is it here. And share those. Okay, that looks, it's an empty slideshow. Um, huh. That's, all right, that's not good, is it? Um, and this is what I sent you? No, it's not. Do you have the slides on your computer? Or um, I do not, unfortunately, on this computer, but um, I can run Git real quick. Won't take two minutes to get it out of my office. Okay, let me see if Dr. Bray is available. She's speaking next. Dr. Okay. Bray, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, would you be able to present your presentation while Dr. Lastly gets his slide? Sure, absolutely. Yeah, okay. Okay, thank you. All right, sorry guys. That, that's okay. So let me introduce Dr. Bray real, real quick. So for those of you who don't know, this is Dr. Jennifer Bray. She's an orthopedic surgeon with Cool as well, who specializes in pediatric orthopedics and specifically enjoys sports medicine and trauma. She earned her medical degree here in, at the University of Louisville School of Medicine or her medical degree and completed an orthopedic residency at Drexel University. Yeah, but I just don't want to go through the slides. In Philadelphia. She then completed a fellowship in pediatric orthopedic surgery at the Campbell Clinic in Memphis, Tennessee. She has a clinical faculty appointed with the University of Louisville School of Medicine Department of Orthopedic Surgery, where she's the assistant program director. And also she earned four varsity letters in swimming at UofL. She's going to talk about OCD and for a lot of the pediatricians and other people in the community that does not stand for obsessive compulsive disorder. Okay, can you all see my screen? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I, when I submitted this talk, I submitted it as OCD, and then I'm like, oh, wait, maybe, maybe people don't know that it's not the same thing, and I, I really, who doesn't, I, I don't know. Um, but actually, there's three kinds of OCD. Um, the main one I'm going to talk about is osteochondritis desiccans, which is a very specific entity, but I also take care of another OCD called an osteochondral defect, which is a traumatic injury to the bone and cartilage, uh, typically around the knee. And here's just a little arrow pointing at an osteochondral body uh, from a patella dislocation uh, and then obsessive compulsive disorder. While I am very type A, I do not actually have OCD, um, but I do like some clean hands and a clean desk. Um, so OCD, so osteochondritis desiccans. Um, from, from the Latin, it, it, osteo is bone, chondro is cartilage, and desiccans is actually kind of a made up word, um, but it actually is kind of related to dissecting. Uh, this piece is actually dissecting from the underlying bone. And it was first described in 1888 uh, by a Dr. Koenig in Germany. Um, and what he had noticed was that there was a subchondral process. Um, and what actually happens, and I'll get more into the, the pathology of this, is that this is actually a bone disease that affects the cartilage. 
and OCDs have been described in 50 distinct areas uh, of the body. Uh, the most common one that, that I treat is knee OCD, uh, but I also treat OCDs of the ankle, OCDs of the elbow. Actually, that was the last surgery that I did this week was an elbow OCD. Um, so it, it can occur in different areas. And what it is, it's a focal idiopathic disorder of the subchondral bone. Um, again, typically going to be in the knee. Um, and the problem with this is that as that bone dies, the overlying cartilage, that smooth layer that's sitting over top, starts to get disrupted. And then the cartilage will actually fall off. Now you've got a bare spot of bone. Now you have arthritis and potentially a very young person. The causes are actually fairly unknown. Um, we do think that it happens in kids who are very often very active. So we do think it is more of a rep repetitive injury. Um, we don't think it happens in kids that are more, you know, video game, couch potato type kids, but we honestly don't know because maybe they never get to the point where it's symptomatic. Um, there has been some theory that it's an inflammatory process of the bone, that it takes place in a watershed area where maybe the blood supply isn't as, as robust as other parts of the knee. Could there be a genetic cause? Is it avascular necrosis? And kind of none of those theories have fully panned out. Most of it seems to be um, more activity related. And I am so sorry, but of course, something just popped up on my screen that I was looking at four hours ago. There we go. Okay. Um, epidemiology. So it, this is more common in males, about a two to one ratio, and it tends to be younger males. And very often these are skeletally immature males, um, more common in athletes, more common in African-American children. And there is an association with a discoid meniscus. So if you see that orange arrow on the left, that is actually pointing at a very wide meniscus. That's a discoid lateral meniscus. And kind of what the theory is, is that a discoid meniscus acts like a jack. It actually it kind of widens that lateral joint, which could, in theory, put more increased pressure on the medial side of the joint, leading to the OCD. You can see that little white cyst at the right arrow over there. Um, I've had a fair number of patients that have had discoid. Sometimes it occurs in the medial joint, and sometimes the direct pressure from the discoid pushing up on the femur will also cause it in the lateral joint. Uh, and there's a decently high instance of bilaterality, um, typically actually at the time of presentation, um, but overall not particularly rare, maybe 15 to 30, 000, 30 cases per 100,000 um, people. Um, and it is a disorder of youth. Um, there is an associated disorder that happens in older people um, from spontaneous osteonecrosis of the, of the femur typically, uh, but in kids it seems to be, again, more activity related and apparently in lab puppies too. Had no idea. Um, the diagnosis is, it can be really difficult to make because it starts out with a very diffuse history. Uh, kids will report that they have knee pain with activity. Well, most kids have knee pain with enough activity. So always kind of a weak sign there. But when it starts to get a little bit more worrisome is when they start saying, well, every time I run, if I go to soccer practice for an hour, my knee's really swollen and puffy for the next 24 hours or so. And it, and it goes away when I rest and put some ice on it, but it happens the next time I go back out. So that's always kind of a red flag. Mechanical symptoms, catching, popping, locking. They can't, They when they bend their knee, they feel a bunch of cracks and crunkles that uh, are a little bit more than just a cracking the knuckle type sound. Um, and often the symptoms can go on for more than 12 months before a diagnosis is made. Um, and I'd say that's probably about 80% of the OCDs that I treat. The other 20% is I get a knee x-ray because they're in for something else. They sprained it at practice or, you know, they had an acute type injury and you'll see the, I will diagnose a fair number of these just on incidental finding, even though they really aren't symptomatic. Um, physical exam findings are kind of, uh, they're not great. Um, the test that is described particularly for um, OCD lesions is known as a Wilson test. I'll show that in the next image. Basically you twist the knee, you twist the foot, try to get the tibia to internally or externally rotate and then extend it and see if that recreates symptoms or a clunk. Um, uh, pain over the joint line itself tends to be a, a fairly good marker of injury, and typically over the medial joint. Most of these OCDs are medial. Um, it tends to be worse in flexion and the weight-bearing surface of the femur up towards you. And again, they can have an effusion in the office, but they'll often more tell you that they have one, you know, occasionally. 
Uh, this is that picture of the Wilson test. So I typically do this with the patient supine um, because I, I always do a hip exam first. So I, I always tell my residents, if you have somebody coming into your office with diffuse knee pain, always, always, always check the hip. You know, like Dr. Jack said, skippies are fairly common. Um, the easiest way to pick one up is to just see if the hip can move correctly. Um, so once I have that patient supine, I'm going to flex their knee and their hip up to about 90 degrees. Typically, I internally rotate the foot. Most of these lesions are, are medial. Internally rotate the foot and bring it from 90 to 30 should recreate their pain. If you externally rotate, it should make it better. Um, should is kind of a tough word. And this test is also uh, very good for picking up meniscal pathology. So you kind of, it's, it's a good exam for some type of joint line injury, it, it, it's not a great positive predictive value on which one it's going to be. Imaging. So this is the mainstay. So the, again, I pick up a lot of these incidentally, because when a patient comes into my office, I'm going to get four views of their knee. Um, kind of a mistake that's made in a lot of the, you know, primary care offices or ICCs, is that they don't get that tunnel view of the knee. And that's actually really important for picking these up. And I, I don't expect everybody to do that every time, um, but it can be very, very helpful if you're worried about an OCD. And what you're gonna see on an x-ray is you're gonna see an area where instead of having that nice white gray bone um, right above the joint surface, it's gonna look like somebody's chewed a little hole out of it. So that's the necrotic bone. Um, most of the time where you're gonna find this again is the medial femoral condyle. Um, kind of at the lateral portion of it. And, and that's actually where, it, where the PCL inserts. And about 70% of these OCDs are gonna be located there. I also see them in the lateral femoral condyle. Again, some of these are associated with discoid meniscus. Um, and then trochlear and patellar, um, maybe five to 10% of these, they're not super common, uh, but I do see them a, a few times a year. Um, and that tunnel view, the way that x-ray is taken is the patient is actually gonna bend their knee slightly um, and it's taken from back to front. So it's a PA x-ray. And what you're looking for is those defects kind of on the weight bearing surface. And when you bend the knee, that'll swing around a little bit to the front. So it's easier to see. Um, on the x-rays, and I know Dr. Albers will probably talk about this a little bit as well, um, but the epiphysis can look really funny in really, really young kids. So you kind of have to have a degree of suspicion that sometimes it is just a normal variant and I'll get to where those typically sit. Um, MRI is, if I see any lesion on the x-ray that I'm worried about, I'm going straight to MRI. Um, part of that is it's extremely useful for staging. Is this a lesion that needs surgery right away? Is this a lesion that I'm comfortable to watch for several months? Um, and what I'm looking for on that MRI is how much swelling is around the subchondral bone? How dead does that subchondral bone look? Does it look like the piece is beginning to fall out of its um, home? And is the cartilage over top disrupted? Because again, it's a disorder of bone that affects the cartilage. Um, I also use them postoperatively, assess healing. Um, or if I'm just observing, you know, every six months or so, and then for preoperative planning, sometimes you get into the knee and you can't see a thing and I need that MRI to figure out where I need to be looking. So again, normal, normal epiphyseal variant. So these are very, very young kids. And this is a, this is a tunnel view on both of these kids. You can tell because that little U at the bottom of the femur is much bigger and a tunnel view. Um, and you'll see, it just kind of looks like the very back part. Um, I'm pointing at my screen. Let me use the cursor this time. Um, if you look kind of the back part of the femur right here, it just looks irregular. It looks a little mothy and, and rat eaten. Um, you can also see there's little variants on the tibial epiphysis as well. And this is just a very young kid. The epiphysis takes until about six or seven to kind of get its normal contour. This is another kid. He was actually a little bit older, um, but you can look in the back here and it just, there's this, just this really odd looking piece on his lateral condyle. And when I got an MRI, it was completely harmless looking. It's just where the bone hadn't fully ossified yet. So sometimes I can't tell an X-ray. So the MRI is also helpful. Um, radiographs, I won't belabor this point, but what I'm kind of looking at is, is the articular surface still nice and smooth or is it cutting up in a more concave appearance? Is there a big white line around the edge of this that's showing me that there's sclerosis, that the bone is really dead around it? Um, it, um, let's see, I always look at the piece of progeny bone. Is Does it look like this piece is completely separated from the bone around it? Is this piece floating over here somewhere where it's not even supposed to be? Um, and also how big it is, and then I can measure healing from there. Okay, so this is a kid who, this was several years ago now, um, he was about 12 years old, came into the office, vague bilateral knee pain, and his AP x-rays are not 
very exciting. I can kind of see there's a little bit, like there's maybe a little gray spot right there and some little gray spots down here, but not a super impressive x-ray um, until I got a tunnel view. And then it looked like like sharks had attacked his medial femoral condyle. There's just this huge bitten out area on both of his femurs um, that MRI confirmed as being a true OCD lesion. Okay, so um, this is another OCD lesion, not a super impressive AP view. Um, I can kind of see again, some little kind of clear gray areas along the medial femoral condyle. But if you look really closely, there's a little white line sitting right underneath that. And if I zoom in, this is actually a piece that is completely detached uh, from the femur around it. And because it's mostly cartilage, it looks pretty harmless, but you don't wanna see bone away from the, from the remainder of the condyle. Um, this is an example of a trochlear OCD. This one's actually pretty large. Um, that is best seen on lateral view. Those are very subtle. Usually need an MRI to really diagnose. So on MRI, um, what am I looking for on these? I I'm looking for things that are gonna make me take this patient to surgery. So it doesn't look like there's a defect in the cartilage where you don't see that nice smooth rim of cartilage and there's a step off somewhere inside the joint. Um, is there a lot of white uh, fluid? This is fluid in the knee. Um, is there fluid tracking inside the bone underneath the lesion is a bad sign. Are there those little white subchondral cysts that we'll often see? And, base, and is this piece still in place? It has it completely detached. It, in, in studies, it's been shown not to be as reliable. It's, it's, it's harder to tell an unstable lesion from a stable lesion in a child. And I think most of that is just because they have so much healing potential. Sometimes it'll look unstable on an MRI and then really be pretty, pretty benign looking on arthroscopic exam. Um, these are just some MRI classifications. I, I won't go into super detail, but basically as the higher the grade goes, number one is pretty mild, cartilage is pretty healthy. Grades two and three, the cartilage starts to be a little bit more affected. And grade four, the bone and cartilage have completely detached and it's the same with stage five. Um, this is a, a patient of mine who I'll go into, he'll be one of my case presentations here in a little bit. Um, but you can see on this MRI, the bone should be very dark gray, almost black. This is his growth plate right here. You can see all this edema. The bone here looks very, very white compared to the bone of the rest of the femur and the tibia. And you can see these little tiny cysts. The, this is the area that's been really damaged. The cartilage does look a little irregular at the borders of it. Um, and as I keep going through, you can see that cartilage really has a big step off posteriorly. The cysts get a little bit bigger as I get towards the center of the knee. Um, and here's actually a coronal view. Those others are sagittals. Coronal view showing that this little black piece looks like it's completely uh, detached. So I've heard it's called an Oreo cookie sign where you see a layer of black and then a white stripe and then another layer of dead necrotic black bone right here. Um, this is another child who, um, Again, little area of edema, kind of right at the bottom of the femur right here, but the overlying cartilage looks nice and healthy. Um, and then from the side view, about six months later, it's looking a little bit more edematous right here and the cartilage looks probably still pretty healthy, but no big cyst formation. And same thing on the front, even though this piece looks pretty sclerotic, it's stable. Um, he kept having symptoms though, so took him back to the OR several months later, did put a screw in this. This is what the signal is right here at the center. Um, looks kind of like a piece of hardware, which it is, it's plastic. Um, and now the edema has really gone down and the surface looks much, much healthier right here. And then here's a picture from the front. Trochlear OCD, this is a girl, um, not, Super impressive on the MRI. This is the same girl that showed the x-ray of a few slides ago. Just an area of kind of necrosis, a little bit of edema underneath this little lesion. There's the patella. This is the femur right here. Um, but about six months later, that lesion is looking much rougher. The cartilage over here looks completely, um, completely involved. The cartilage, it's still sitting in its home, but it looks pretty edematous and probably pretty unstable. Uh, here's an example of a patellar OCD, just a little kind of a white spot right in the middle of the patella right here. Um, this is just a picture of Dr. Myers since he's not here to defend himself anymore. Um, this actually was on the Cincinnati Reds broadcast uh, the year after the Cubs won the World Series. And I have to include Dr. Meyer because they put him on it. 
Okay, so arthroscopic classification of these. So I've got my MRI. I'm going to take this kid to surgery because I'm worried about this for whatever reason. Yeah. Um, now I'm going to classify this actually looking at it directly um, through the scope. Um, there are older systems uh, kind of looking at adult OCD. It's hard to tell. I don't really use those systems. Um, I use um, a, a, a system that's come out of the ROCK study. That's the Research on Osteochondritis of the Knee study from 2013. And that's a group of pediatric uh, sports medicine docs who have gotten yeah. together and basically come up with a new classification system. Um, here's some of the older adult classification systems again, basically going from one being pretty stable to four being completely. Wilson. Okay, so um, here, again, those adult studies where it's stable, starting to fragment, starting to fragment even in the center and then detach. So um, here is a, um, here, here's a description of the rock study. I'm going to go straight to the graphical description of these. The cue ball, um, these are great. I love it when I see these. Um, it looks like a completely normal piece of cartilage. This is the this is the medial meniscus. This is the tibial surface. I always say the cue ball on top. That's the femor femoral surface, and the cartilage looks pristine. There is absolutely nothing to see. This is why when I say I need that MRI, I need it up in the room because I need to know where to aim. Because if I'm going to fix this, I need to know that I'm in the right spot, and I can't do that without the MRI because the femur looks completely normal because it's the subchondral bone that's injured. Shadow, I see these fairly often. You'll see just a little rim. If you kind of shine the scope in from the right direction, you'll see a little demarcation. Usually if I just kind of poke with my little probe on this part of the cartilage, it'll kind of squish in. It'll look like a golf ball dimple. Whereas if I squish down here outside of that area, it doesn't cause that dimpling. Wrinkle in the rug, I don't see particularly often, um, but it'll look like a, a kind of a demarcated line of cartilage around the center. Um, this is where the OCD is. It's up under this piece right here. This is all normal femur up here. Okay, so these are the ones I hate seeing. I Every time I see these, I definitely get very worried and uh, I'm always cautious to make sure I have the right equipment in the room. So the locked door. So the cartilage here has completely, it is fissured. The subchondral bone in this entire area has died, but the cartilage over top is still intact. You cannot stick this probe into the lesion, but you can kind of probe and feel the edges of it. Um, the trap door, oh, I see these a fair amount, um, where the cartilage is completely fissured off for, you know, a half or three quarters of the lesion, and it's just barely holding on kind of in one corner. Um, and then the last one is one that's just completely detached and there's nothing else to see. It's the piece is floating somewhere else in the knee. So treatment. So I've got my arthroscopic classification. I know what I'm looking at now. And now it's got, I got to figure out what can I do to try to restore this? And there's not really very good consensus about any of the treatment options for OCD. Um, there are multiple centers where patients will be placed into what's called a medial unloader brace, which is a brace that tries to force the knee kind of towards the outside a little bit, what's in, called into valgus, to put more pressure on the outside of the joint and maybe take some of the pressure off the inside of the joint. Problem with that is those braces are very uncomfortable. They have fairly poor compliance. Insurance does not like to pay for any bracing nowadays, um, and they can be quite expensive. I have casted patients before um, who are completely non-compliant with any activity restrictions. Um, so I kind of put them in a bent knee cast so they literally cannot get their foot to the floor. That tends to help keep the weight off of it. Um, not really any, not, not a lot of evidence for bone stimulators. I will tend to make these kids non-weight bearing, especially if their mechanical symptoms are pretty bad and they've got recurrent effusions. I'm just going to get their weight off of it. I don't need to put them in, if they're a compliant kid, I don't need to put them in any special brace or anything. And then definitely get them out of sports. Um, for kids with mild symptoms, I'll tell them, look, you can't play baseball and basketball and football, none of that prolonged running and jumping, but you can still walk back and forth in school. That, that's not going to stress your knee very much. Um, and again, all of these have fairly poor compliance, just like telling a kid with an ACL tear not to run and play. It's not going to happen most of the time. Uh, I love this picture. That's, that, that's a good picture of most of my patients. Okay, so non-surgical treatment. Luckily, for most of the time in children with open physis, they will heal somehow or another. 
if you get them to kind of calm down enough, these typically will resolve. And their symptoms typically resolve really quickly, actually. So for a lot of these kids, that I, either if I make an incidental finding of an OCD or if they've only had symptoms for a little while, typically a short period of rest, I'll often put them in physical therapy just to regain kind of their quad and gluteus strength. Um, their symptoms will resolve. Even if it hasn't fully resolved on their x-rays, they feel much better. And it gets really hard to keep them out of sports at that point. So that's a long discussion that we have. Most of the time, um, uh, more than half the time in kids with open physis, these will go on to spontaneously resolve in six to 18 months. It's not perfect, but most of the time these will heal. And I always tell families, look, if we're pretty conscientious, there's a good chance he won't need, he or she won't need any surgery. Um, this is a young girl. She was a very competitive field hockey player. Um, but kind of the first exam, these are all tunnel x-rays. Kind of first exam, I can tell there's an irregularity of the medial femoral condyle, but it's not super impressive. Second set of x-rays two months later, you can see that this little progeny piece of bone looks like it's not fully connected to kind of the overlying little cave that it sits in. But, but two months after that, it's getting a lot wider. It's starting to look more normal in contour. And by a little less than a year after kind of resume, after starting therapy, this is almost completely gone. And she was really only out of field hockey for about six to nine months. And then I had let her gone back to hockey. And then this is what her x-rays looked like two months after that. So it really did have time to heal. And then she could get back to doing her normal stuff without causing a recurrence. Um, so older kids, um, are more likely to need surgical treatment, especially beyond skeletal maturity. They just don't have the healing potential of a younger kid. Um, so kind of one of, my, one of my criteria for kids who need surgery is kids who have symptomatic lesions who have been, that have been present for more than six months and have open physis. Three months for closed physis, I'm probably still gonna go closer to six. And again, these are symptomatic kids. Even if their x-rays look unchanged, if they're symptomatic, that to me is a surgical indication. Um, if they are asymptomatic, but the lesion hasn't gone after six to 12 months, then I'm a little bit more um, aggressive with surgery. But asymptomatic kids, I'm, I'm definitely willing to sit on a lot longer. Um, there are two different, there's kind of three different um, arms of surgical treatment. Reparative is what I am typically trying to do. I want to fix the bone that is there so that the cartilage over top can be saved. And that's either with drilling or drilling with fixation. Palliative is kind of, is really reserved for really small lesions where the pace has fallen off and I'm just trying to get something new to grow there or just let it fill in on its own. And then restorative, I'm trying to do something to reestablish the normal bone and cartilage that's supposed to be there. Um, so also when I'm doing my arthroscopic treatment, I'm gonna make sure I treat the other disorders. So again, this is a kid with a discoid lateral meniscus. It's a little bit tough to tell if you don't look at a lot of these. This is the tibial surface. This is the ACL, that's the femur. And this meniscus is covering the entire tibial surface. It should not do that. It should be back around the rim. So what I do is actually cut out the center part of the discoid. Now it's, it looks more like a C, like it's supposed to. And now I'm gonna treat the, the OCD at the same time. So it was kind of a double surgery. So for drilling, um, drilling is the kind of the go-to for most of these pediatric OCDs, especially the stable lesions that are immobile. The cartilage is intact. What I'm trying to do is I'm trying to get the bone to heal. And I do that by making it bleed. And I do that by poking a bunch of holes in it. Um, I usually do transarticular drilling because I do this arthroscopically, which means I stick a little tiny drill actually through the cartilage. So I do damage the cartilage, um, very small holes to try to get that bone underneath to heal. Um, the studies on this actually show that even even if you do go through the cartilage, it, the outcomes are the same as if you come from the other side of the femur and drill it extra articularly. Um, I do use a small drill uh, because it has flutes in it and it tends to leave kind of a cleaner surface on the bone. You can also do this with a solid K wire um, and you drill a few centimeters deep, trying to get back to that healthy bone beyond the lesion of necro beyond the area of necrosis. Um, so this is a cue ball lesion. Not very exciting. Again, I'm looking at my MRI to try to figure out exactly where I'm looking because the, the fem femoral surface is so benign. And then I do poke a bunch of holes in it. So these are all like little one and a half millimeter holes. It looks very large on the screen, um, but little tiny holes in the femur to try to get that bone to, re to, get that bone to heal. Um, this is a trochlear OCD that I actually did a few years ago. Um, this is that same girl, she keeps popping up, but kind of a soft area 
right at the top of the femur. This is the patella would be up here. Um, and basically poked a bunch of holes in that to try to get that to stabilize. And that went on to heal pretty well. Oh, sorry, a couple more images of that same trochlear lesion. So for extra articular drilling, that's when you come from the other side of the femur and you actually poke a, you actually create a small hole in the skin from the outside of the femur, outside of the thigh and actually drill to just below the cartilage trying to do the same things. And again, the results are about the same, even though you don't violate the cartilage on the, on the extra articular drilling. Um, kind of the theory I always tell my patients is this is, this is my dad and he does not drive fancy cars. So he bought this truck a few years ago and it was old when he bought it. It's got some nice rust stains. It looks great. Um, but the roof of the truck was completely falling down. So my dad did what every dad does is he took a bunch of nails and nailed it back up to the roof of the truck. And that's what I tell patients I'm doing when I'm trying to fix this cartilage. I'm trying, to, if I'm actually putting fixation into the cartilage, I'm trying to push that cartilage back up into place. So when, when the bone heals, it's got something to stick to. I just, I don't use, you know, wood nails, but. So for internal fixation, this is used for larger lesions or lesions where the cartilage is looking a little bit squishier and kind of poking out a little bit at you when you're looking at it. Um, there's multiple different brands. I don't have any financial interest in any of these any of these companies, which I should have said earlier, I have no conflicts to disclose. Um, but there's different versions of like, basically these are kind of like drywall anchors. I'm just trying to push these in here to connect the cartilage and kind of compress it down on the subchondral bone. So the cartilage is still attached to something while the bone heals up underneath. And there's different versions. These are headless screws. I use these if I need a little bit more compression. These again, don't give much compression. They just kind of hold everything in place. Um, this is an example. So this is a, um, uh, a more kind of a sticky out lesion, kind of more of a, just forgot the name of this. This is the locked door lesion. I'm sorry. So the locked door, the cartilage is completely intact all the way around this, but I can tell the subchondral bone is not healthy because it's pooching out at me. So what I'm going to do in this one is I'm going to be a little bit more aggressive. This is a two millimeter screw. It looks absolutely gigantic under magnification, but this is just a two millimeter compression screw. And what I'm doing is I'm trying to push this cartilage back to the subchondral bone. Then I'm gonna drill a whole bunch of little holes around it. And some of these have those little anchors in it, those little darts. Uh, and I'm just gonna try to hold everything in place and let it heal up on its own. The outcomes, uh, again, for kids are pretty good. There's not a lot of studies in kids. Rock is still, producing papers every few months uh, about more of the long-term uh, aspects of this, but so far it looks a lot better. Um, so restorative procedures. So this is a piece of cartilage that is completely attached. It's not even near the femur at this point. It's just floating free within the knee. Um, so what I'm going to try to do in these, uh, in these instances is do something to try to put some cartilage on the knee so that they're not left with a bare bone spot again, which is arthritis. So I'm going to take out the damaged piece. Um, this is just removing this little piece of necrotic cartilage right there. And in this case, I did a micro fracture. Um, I wasn't sure what I was going to find in this kid. So I always kind of tell the parents, look, I'm just going to do a look around, see how big this is, remove the old piece. And then I'm going to drill some holes and see if I can get something called fibrocartilage to grow. It's kind of like a scar cartilage. It's not as good as normal hyaline cartilage, but it's better than bone. So this is kind of what it looked like when I was done. It has fairly good results. It works better in younger kids. Um, not as good of an outcome, especially in older people. I, I hear a lot of NBA players that have microfracture on their knees and then they play one more season and they're done. It, it just never works as well in older people. And it can provide initial relief, but they, because it's not normal articular cartilage, it tends to degenerate quicker over time. So like I had told that kid, when you start having symptoms, come on back and I'll do something else to try to fix that cartilage, but I don't expect it to last forever. Um, like I said, I did an OCD on Monday, even though it was an elbow. And what I did in that case was something called OATS. This stands for Osteochondral Autograph Transport System. I'm going to take some bone from somewhere else in the knee where it's not needed as much, and I'm gonna put it into the defect um, that I have in the femur. Um, this can be done with multiple small plugs. The one I did the other day was just one large plug. I've actually got pictures of that later. Um, there is a 
There are some other methods of putting the patient's own cartilage back. This is a method called ACI, um, where a little bit of cartilage is harvested from the femur, kind of, again, in a kind of a non-articular spot. It's sent off to a lab. They make it into a matrix. You bring the patient back four to six weeks later, and you put their own cartilage back onto the femur. There is a one-step process now called Macy, which I am not trained in, but again, pretty early results look pretty promising. Oats, um, again, you're using your own good articular cartilage. Scores are looking better versus the fibrocartilage that you get from microfracture. ACI has pretty good uh, outcomes, especially in younger kids. Not as good in older patients. Luckily, I don't take care of those. Um, and again, just kind of long-term data is still lacking a little bit because that is a pretty new technique. Um, osteochondral allograft, if you have a bone, a huge piece of bone. This is almost the entire medial femoral condyle. These are for very large lesions where you can cut a piece out of a, of a cadaver piece of bone, place that into the knee, and pray for the best. Um, not really done very often in kids, but it is an also an option. Um, these are the clinical practice guidelines from about nine years ago, uh, created by our academy, discussing kind of the non-surgical and surgical treatments for OCD lesions. And basically everything is really weak or really inconclusive. Kind of the only one I take out of this is that if a patient comes in and they've got an OCD on one side, I'm going to take an x-ray of the other side. It, it doesn't cost the patient hardly anything, a little bit more radiation. I do the x-rays at the same time, and I can at least make sure they don't have bilateral lesions, but everything else has pretty weak evidence. Recovery, um, I do most of their healing assessments on radiographs, but again, I do typically repeat MRIs every several months to look at the status of the cartilage. Most of these patients feel much better uh, before their radiographs have completely returned to normal. Most return to sports way sooner than I want them to, but I guess that's a good thing. Um, I almost always do physical therapy for any of these post-operative patients. They've usually been very deconditioned for several months prior to surgery, and then that makes them even worse. Um, almost all of these surgeries do require several weeks of protected weight bearing. If I'm drilling holes in that bone, I need to keep the weight off of it to try to get the bone to get reestablished. And again, not really a recommendation regarding unloader braces. I typically do not do them. I will sometimes do a hinge brace just for comfort alone. Um, how much time do I have? I have a little bit. Okay. Um, I'm just going to run through a couple of case examples. This is a kid. Um, he was about 10 years old, presented with his right knee again. It looks like a little rat just kind of nibbled on the back of his femur right here. Um, MRI, not particularly concerning. A little bit of kind of a almost like a subchondral fracture line right here, that little black line, lots of edema in the femur. Um, a year later, looked no better, looked a little bit more rat bitten on the x rays, a little bit more sclerotic on the MRI. Um, took him to surgery, just drilled holes in it, didn't put any fixation in it, and by six months post-op, almost completely back to normal, and he was back to really competitive soccer. This was his left knee about six months later. He had always kind of had um, kind of growth plate pain, especially at the bottom of his patella, so he had syndic larsen johansson syndrome. X-ray is not particularly exciting, um, and here he was about a year after that. This is that piece I was talking about in that previous x-ray. So cyst formation kind of in the bone, the bone here on the medial surface does not look particularly healthy and there is a loose piece in there. This is what his MRI looked like. This piece is detaching. You can see the big step off right here. It looks like this piece is just running away from the rest of the femur. Um, this is what his coronal view looked like. Again, little cyst formation, but really necrotic bone, very, very dark black right here, Oreo cookie sign. Um, this is the one that I actually had to go and remove and do the microfracture on. Had to kind of debride the rest of the cartilage right here. Actually looked pretty nice. He's doing pretty well. Um, at his last MRI, um, subchondral bone actually looks pretty healthy here. It looks a little bit irregular on this sagittal view, but the bony edema has gone way down. Most of the cysts have completely resolved or are resolving. Um, this is a kid who uh, I've been taking care of for several years. He's a bit of a handful, but I like him. Um, again, rat bitten, looks like somebody just chewed off the back of his femur back here. AP view doesn't look that scary. Got an MRI and he had quite a bit of edema back here, a lot of sclerosis along the bottom of the femur. And just as an added bonus, if you look really closely, he actually has a discoid lateral meniscus on this other side. The meniscus should end about here. His goes all the way across the knee to the other side. Um, so here that is on the, on the sagittal views, you can see that discoid going all the way across the femur. And this is the lateral side, so it's not the side of the OCD. Um, fix the discoid, put some darts in there, 
And by two months post-op, the lesion looks much, much, much better. Um, and by seven months later, it's almost completely gone. And then of course he came back and he had the same thing on his other side, um, did similar treatment, treated the discoid, drilled and fixed the disc, drilled and fixed the OCD lesion. This is a girl who, um, I don't have her pre-images, but um, she came in, had a pretty bad looking OCD lesion on her MRI. And I was like, well, you're skeletally immature. Let me try to fix this and put some darts in it because the cartilage really looked pretty healthy. So I was like, let's give this a try. Um, symptoms did not get any better. Her synovitis was getting much worse. She was having trouble walking on it. So about four months after her initial surgery, I brought her back and this is uh, a screw that is not holding on to anything. So the cartilage around this lesion has completely died. Um, the screw is loose because it's not in any type of good bone right there. Um, and that's me trying to turn off the video, not very well. Oh, next slide. So she got an oats. So what I did is I took a small plug of bone from the top of her femur up here. This is a 10 millimeter plug. I took out the old necrotic area and basically put this in where the old one was. So this is a piece of cartilage from another part of the femur. Um, and then since I had some gaps around the side of that, I put in some allograft cartilage. So some donated cartilage matrix. Basically I put that in place around the lesion and that's actually some fiber and glue just holding that in place. But that looks like a much healthier femur than the one from the video a couple slides ago. So this is only about two weeks out. So I'll be curious to see what it looks like in another six months, but I'll check an MRI at that point. Um, so future research, um, I am a member, as is Dr. Wilson of the Pediatric Research and Sports Medicine Society. Uh, we meet yearly. I'm on a few subcommittees for um, meniscus uh, research, um, also in a database for different types of orthopedic problems, but there's also the Rock Study Group who've been doing this longer than I've been out of training. Uh, but they, again, present, present articles pretty frequently about kind of their long-term outcomes on this. Um, and here's just my last picture of Dr. Meyer, because again, he did get on fan cam twice and I got to give him credit for it. So, all right. And there's just a couple of my acknowledgements and that's all I've got. Thank you. That was a very good talk.